So welcome back everyone for our third installment of our live history lessons here at the Historic Wendover Airfield. Things are pretty slow around here as I'm sure they are at most places, but we actually just had a plane pull in behind us, so who knows what we'll see here on a regular day. But today we uh, mentioned that we're going to be taking a tour of our Norden Bombsite storage building. So that's where we'll be heading here in a second. But just uh, to start off with, again, if you have any questions during the video, let us know. We'll try to answer them as we go. And at the end, we'll also do a short question and answer if anyone has questions about the topic, the base, World War II, or if you have recommendations for future topics, let us know. But to go along with the Norden Bombsite building that we're going to be touring, we're going to talk a bit about bombardiers. So these are the guys that sit in the nose of the airplane. They use what's called a bomb sight, and they're actually looking through that um, to figure out when they need to drop the bomb so that those are going to follow a certain path and hit, hopefully, the target. So Windover was a heavy bomber training base, so we had a lot of that kind of thing going on. And here behind us, it's currently the historic Windover fire station. But during World War II, this was actually used for bombardier training, and that will probably be something we'll touch on in a future video when we tour through that building. But all throughout the base, heavy bombers and bombardiers were getting the training they needed so they could hopefully take out the enemy successfully and help shorten the war. But now we're going to step inside our building, give you a view of the outside here real quick. It's not too large, it's pretty unassuming, but during most of World War II, this was the number one most secure place on base. And we'll see why in a second when we come inside. Give it a second to see how the light adjusts there. We got it good. Okay. So here we just have a brief display about bomber training. Here we can see how we have our bombardier. The bomb site, the bomb, the airplane, and that equals a big explosion. We actually took that right out of a World War II manual. That's the basic idea of what these guys are doing. So we can get a couple close-ups just to see, again, what the bombardier is. They're the ones sitting in the nose of the aircraft there. And this one's actually looking through his bomb site. And then here in the bottom of the case, we have the bombardier's case. So in this, he would have carried all these flight tools that you see in this picture up here. And he also would have carried all of his um, bomb tables and any information he needed so that they could um, carry out the mission for that day. We have our flight computers and everything else. These guys were pretty much navigators with having to know how the bombs work on top of that. So they had an important job because if the bombardier isn't doing what he's supposed to, well, I don't know why they're flying. But here in the entryway, you can see our historic um, soda machine there. Maybe someday we'll get that fixed up for you. Let me hit the door. So these guys would have came in and they would have uh, checked in. So what happened with the bomb site is it was top secret throughout the war, and we'll see a bit more of that. But when these guys were actually done with a mission, they would physically remove that bomb site from the nose of the aircraft. It was always covered. The bomb was actually issued a sidearm, a 45 caliber pistol, so that he could protect his bomb site if need be. But he would bring that to this building, he would check in here, he would have forms he needed to fill out to say if anything went wrong with the bomb site, who he is, what plane this came from, and then he would be allowed entrance into the vault. But before you get to the vault, we have our generator here, you'll see as a mission essential building because if they didn't have the bomb sites working there was not much point for the guys to be flying their training missions to learn how to be bomber crews so this is our generator and again as a mission essential building this is really the only evidence we found on base where a building has its own backup power supply in a form of a generator like this so that really tells you where this building ranked Got our old flathead. Looks like it's straight out of an old farm tractor. And 
And so inside this room, this was the actual storage vault as well as the maintenance um, portion of the building. So those guys would come in here with their bomb sites. There's an officer of the day in charge. He's going to make sure they're allowed to be in here and accept the bomb site for the bombardier. They would have their board to show all the bomb sites that they're working on or storing. As you can see they have dates, names, aircraft serial numbers, and the serial numbers for the bomb sites. So this is how they're keeping track of their work as they go. But before we go further, we'll talk a little bit more about the bomb site and why it was so important. So by the 1920s, um, the US military was looking for ways that they could more accurately drop bombs. There were some pretty simple bomb sites that were developed in World War I, but they wanted something better naturally after that. So we had a guy named Carl Norden who was first uh, looked upon by the US Navy to develop a bomb site for them that they might be able to use. So in the 1920s, he rolled out his first version and that wasn't the most successful. It didn't quite outperform other bomb sites of the era, but he kept working on that. Um, there was one test done in 1927 by the War Department to test this early bomb site. And after over five days flying 20 missions a day, they finally destroyed this target on the fifth day after dropping all that ordnance. And kind of in response to that dismal failure, General James Feshett, who was the commanding officer of the U.S. Army Air Corps at the time, said, I cannot too strongly emphasize the importance of a bomb site of precision since the ability of bombardment aviation to perform its mission of destruction is almost entirely dependent upon an accurate and practical bomb site. So again, if these guys are going to be flying bombing missions, there's really no point to do so unless they have a bomb site that's going to accomplish what they need. So by the early 1930s, they introduced the Mark 15 version of the Norden bomb site, still designed by Carl Norden, and that's what we see here. So this was really an early analog computer, has over 2,300 moving parts. And all this, it really helped the bombardier calculate what he needed to do with the bombs. He would input information like altitude, airspeed, wind drift, etc. Um, and once he got this eyepiece, which we can see right here, if we hold it up top, you might actually even be able to see the crosshairs, just barely. But he would look through that eyepiece, that's where the crosshairs would be, so he'd be following that. And once the bomb site really got set up on that um, sighting line, this would help steer the airplane and actually connect to the aircraft's autopilot. So let me just fire up something for you while you browse our bomb site there. And our cameraman's welcome to talk here also. <laughs> <clears throat> no, the cameraman is not supposed to talk. <laughs> but just to let you know, as he was looking through these crosshairs in there, he had two knobs he would use. One was right here, and one was right here. Those were rate motors so he could keep the crosshairs focused on the target. <clears throat> and then he entered airspeed and altitude. And then when these two needles right there, when that, those two came together, that's where he would drop the bomb. So this is our not so smooth running gyro, but this will give you an idea of how these helped keep the um, bomber in line for the target. So here we have our super precision gyro. Just don't drop them on marble floors we found out or it's going to jar some um, bearings there. But we have a B-29 here rigged up so that we can move it around and you can see regardless of what the airplane is doing, the gyros help keep 
the bomb site stabilized. They actually had a gyro in that top portion that you just saw, and they had something called the stabilizer that was in the nose and was not removed from there that had a different orientation of gyro. So through the combination of these, that's what would actually help steer the aircraft as it was going along through the air there. And this is just fun to play with. So if you come visit us in the future when we're not too worried about viruses being spread, we might let you play with this little doohickey there. But that's the Norden bomb site in a nutshell. So we have out here our representation of how it actually works. So the bombardier is actually figuring out his line of sight here to the target. And that's kind of where all of this um, rate or angle of drift and all these other factors come into play. So as he gets that lined up through the bomb site, it's going to know when it needs to drop the bomb so that they'll follow this trajectory to the target. That's the whole point of the bomb site. So the U.S. Army Air Force spent about one and a half billion dollars on Norden bomb sites because they said this is a precision piece of equipment that we are going to use for our strategic bombing campaign. We are going to knock the socks off of our enemy and do it accurately. So that's why we really followed through with this idea of strategic daylight precision bombing. Because we said, we're going to fly in the daytime. Even though we can be shot at, we know we're going to hit our targets. So, so that's what aircraft like the B-24, the B-17, and really most of our bombers at the time were using. And then Later in the wars, we got the B-29. They were using the same thing, though they also had a special Sperry bomb site that could be used for radar-guided bombing as well. But the Norden bomb site was preferred if you had that line of sight without cloud cover, etc. So, <clears throat> I don't know where I'm going. You, you might explain that. <clears throat> that diving turn that the B-29 is making. So you can see this different representation. These are conventional bombers, like mostly what we were training, B-24s and B-17s. They could continue flying over that target because they're not worried about these bombs that were dropped down here from 20,000 feet or more. But when we got to the B-29 crew that was trained here for the atomic missions, they had to figure out when they released this atomic bomb how to actually get out of there because even though they were flying at 30,000 feet they were going to be in trouble if they continued flying over their intended point so they made this banking turn I think it was about 155 degrees they just cranked out of there did a dive to gain speed and within five minutes of the bomb being dropped not five minutes Within about a minute of the bomb being dropped, they were almost five miles away from the actual target. So that's one of the tactics they figured out here in Wendover for the atomic mission. But, so going on, so throughout the war, because this is what our entire strategic bombing strategy was based upon, this was a top secret device. Now we found out later that the plans were actually given to the Germans by like 1938 because a German spy was working for the Norden company and gave the plans to the Nazis. But we were unaware of that at the time and we still had to keep this secret from other eyes. So that's why we had in this building five bank vaults. So these are actually Diebold bank vaults. If we, yep, you can actually see the label there. So there they would have the combination, they would crank that door open, and inside there is a lot of concrete. So you can tell they weren't messing around trying to protect these bomb sites. So they would have had storage shelves pretty much like these, where they could have kept all these bomb sites. Again, we could have up to about 200 aircraft here at a time, so who knows how many bomb sites we might have to store at any given time as well. So throughout the country at historic um, airfields, you might actually see some of these vaults sitting out in fields because the concrete hasn't been taken down. But we're only aware of possibly one other building that's been restored and is still standing around the original vault. So this is a very special place for Army Air Force history.
So these bombardiers, in order to figure out how to use the Norden bomb site, um, they went through a number of weeks of just pre-flight training, making sure that they were qualified to actually fly in an aircraft, that they're going to be able to withstand such situations. Then they would go through six weeks of gunnery school, which we actually talked about last week, because in addition to their bombing, when they're not on the actual bomb run, they're responsible for protecting the nose of the aircraft. But then, after that six weeks, they had another 20 weeks of training just to learn how to use the bomb site, to figure out all those calculations, the math, the science that went into making this the accurate piece of technology it was. So I'll show you another one of our vaults. This one just has some radio parts in it, but again, you get an idea of what they were putting forth to protect this technology. Now you've probably heard the, sl the term, or the <laughs> slogan that a Norden bomb site could drop a bomb in a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet. Well that wasn't so much the case. They more or less did that under perfect circumstances. They were able to hit about a hundred foot um, circle from 20,000 feet. But imagine going into combat where you have anti-aircraft guns firing at you, there's typically cloud cover, etc. By the end of the war, that was reduced more to like they could hit four square city blocks. But again, you have upwards of two or three hundred aircraft in the air at a time, so chances are you're going to hit something. But by the end of the war, strategic bombing surveys said, we only hit about 30% of our bombs within 800 feet of the target. So this was not quite what it was um, supposed to be, was not as accurate as it was touted to be, but this um, determined Army Air Force strategy during World War II, and it made us at least more as accurate as we could be, trying to limit civilian casualties and hit our intended targets that were hopefully going to end the war. So again over here we have our a workbench where they could have been maintaining these. I'll just give you an idea of what that might have looked like. See here they have the bomb sites dismantled. So they would be in here maintaining these, calibrating them before missions to make sure they were at their peak efficiency. This was also a climate controlled building because these were precise pieces of equipment. So we actually had ventilation systems running through here to keep this a cool temperature so that our bomb sites were safe and ready to be used. Here we would have had our officer's table. We got our typewriter there. And then we have this example of a different maintenance building. Here in the background, their walls covered in pinup girls. So that's why, as an homage, we have a few of our own. So if you can name any of those, feel free to chime in too in the comments as well. But one of the big takeaways of this is that being a bombardier was serious business. The bombardiers took an oath that they would protect this device with life and limb. They were willing to risk their life so that this secret technology that would help America win the war would not get into the hands of the enemy. So that's quite a hefty uh, load on their shoulders, but they did their best during the war and really helped us pull through. So if there are any questions out there, let us know right now. Yeah, the question is, Lucille Ball was a pinup girl, question mark? Apparently. She was there before I was, so I'll say she sure was. Give you some final That's moments of panning, and we hope to see you next week. Again, if you have any recommendations for future topics, let us know in the comments or on our YouTube video when we get this uploaded, but thanks for joining us.